It is an immense honor to welcome you to the third Sarah Kailat Memorial Lecture on the theme of women and leadership. My name is Lawrence Cohen. I'm the director of Berkeley's Institute for South Asian Studies. I'm delighted to welcome as Sarah Kailat Memorial Lecturer, Ambassador Nirupam Rao, who will be delivering an address this evening entitled Women Who Lead, Pages from an Indian Story. As you will see, Ambassador Rao is an immensely thoughtful and engaging speaker. And we're delighted she could come to Berkeley and to the great efforts of Tom Kailat and Anu Luther to make this happen. In opening, I want to say a few words about the person who brings us together this evening, the late Sarah Kailat, and then to ask Tom Kailat if he might be willing to address us and to speak in a way I, of course, could not to the ideals in the life of, of Sarah Kailat. Sarah Kailat was a well-known educator and philanthropist in California whose commitment to advancing the role of women and girls as leaders in public life took her from a village in South India where she was born and raised to, into the heady life of Silicon Valley. I did not know Mrs. Kailat, but as the current holder of the Sarah Kailat Chair in Indian Studies, with my three predecessors facing me, uh, I, like them, bear her legacy each day, and I'm very conscious of her life and example. The Sarah Kailat Chair was established in 1992 by Professor Tom Kailat of Stanford University, in his wife's name. With a generous commitment to this university, he was joined by his friends, Naren and Vinita Gupta, Sarah Kailat was a modest person who did not wish to be singled out for praise or publicity. It was in keeping with her wishes that during her lifetime, her name was not explicitly mentioned in the programs and projects sponsored by the chair, which have sustained our institute uh, for many years. After her passing, her family and friends and scholars and community members from across California came together for the inauguration of a permanent Sarah Kailat Memorial Lecture Series on Women and Leadership, established by Tom Kailat. The lectureship is focused on women's rights and capabilities, on women's philanthropic commitments, and always to the question, more broadly, to leadership. The ambassador has been preceded in this lectureship by California Attorney General Kamala Harris and by noted philanthropist and water activist Roni Lakani. Thomas Kailat's generosity, vision, and commitment to friendship have made this lectureship possible. And again and again in events that he's tied to, you see how a circle of friends is so central that he brings together. Dr. Kailat is an electrical and control engineer, an information theorist, and a mathematician, an entrepreneur. He is the Itachi American Professor of Engineering Emeritus at Stanford University, where he has taught and led for many decades. He's known for his pathbreaking work on signal processing. Many of the technologies we use each day are transformed, our lives are transformed by his work. Trained at the University of Pune and then MIT, he has won many great honors. But today I'll restrict myself to the latest of these. Mm -hmm. This week, President Barack Obama has announced that Thomas Kailat is the recipient of the highest of all honors given in the United States to a scientist. That is the National Medal of Science. And as Tom comes to the podium, please join me in offering him deserved congratulations. Lawrence, thank you for your generous introduction. Ambassador Rao, thank, and uh, Consul General Parthasarathy and distinguished guests, let me welcome all of you to this third event. Uh, I plan to uh, briefly describe the origin of this lecture series and thank those who helped organize it. Uh, my first and foremost thanks, of course, to our distinguished speaker this evening, Ambassador Rao, who is a great exemplar of a woman leader. She very graciously agreed to put this into her schedule. She's very busy giving talks around the world, working on her own lectures at Brown and her book. Uh, but she's, you'll hear that she has put a lot of effort into her remarks this evening. <coughs> Professor Cohen will make a formal introduction of our speaker a little later. My sincere thanks to all of you for at the end of a long working day for making time to come here, including especially family and friends from rather far away from Berkeley. 
Punita Kali, Kala and Sanchita and the staff of the center have worked hard to make this event successful and you know, keep all of you well informed about what's happening. The origin of this uh, series is actually, as briefly, uh, it was a surprise uh, gift for Sarah's 50th birthday and our 30th wedding anniversary in 1992. And she was totally surprised by it. The Consul General at the time, Sati Lamba, was at a party at our house, which I'm not good at these things, but I managed to pull it off. Sarah had been taken off by a friend. It was announced, and of course she was happy, but then later she said to me, you, you know that I don't like such <laughs> publicity. So she did attend the inauguration by uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, the famous astrophysicist and Nobel laureate. But after that, as Lauren said, she said, please do not mention me explicitly. She even did not want us after her passing. She fought a valiant battle with cancer for five and a half years after having been diagnosed at stage four and given six months to live. But she had a strong spirit and uh, went through gallantly to the end. And we were blessed that 80 or 90 percent of the time she had a decent quality of life. So we went against her wishes. We did have a celebration of her life. And then with the help of Raka and so on, we uh, decided to have this public lecture series. And as Lawrence has said, we've had very distinguished speakers. And we are going to hear the next one now. The main difficulty was finding an appropriate theme for the lecture series. Uh, that would have appropriate, so let me read that would appropriately commemorate her lifelong dedication to service to others. That was one of our hallmarks of her character, actually. She loved nothing better than making other people happy. Uh, and this included her founding of a charitable trust dedicated to the uplift and empowerment of women of limited means, women and children of limited means, and to which she devoted a lot of attention during her, uh, especially the last five and a half years, of her battle with cancer. So uh, we had uh, several discussions with family and others, but then in a final meeting with Raka, who was then the Sarah Kailath professor, and uh, Anu, Dr. Anu Maitra, who was at that time a longtime family friend, uh, who had successfully established and run since 2002 a very successful lecture series at, Stan at Santa, Santa Cruz, <laughs> University of California, Santa Cruz. When it comes to S, Stanford nationally, <laughs> 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 it comes to my mouth. And uh, so she has since, we are since, I'm happy to tell you, since especially been uh, together for a few years and officially married last Thanksgiving, 2013, November 28th. And Anu, uh, in the course of a lively discussion, Anu made a couple of very pertinent observations about the theme. First, she said that Sarah herself had left behind the answer in the trajectory of her life, in the causes she had championed during her lifetime, and in the charter of her trust. Secondly, that Sunday, the Sunday before our meeting, the New York Times Magazine had, had arrived and this is one of the highlights of the week for Anu. She waits for that Sunday magazine so she could do the crossword puzzle. <laughs> it's a special crossword with an exciting theme. But the cover that week was why women's rights are the cause of our time. <clears throat> and the whole issue was devoted to that. The lead article was by Nicholas Kristof, who is well known for his efforts there. And the overall theme emerging from that special issue was that while the paramount moral challenges of the last two centuries had been slavery in the 18th century and totalitarianism in the 20th, in this century it is the abuse of and discrimination against women. And around that time, as just one example, the World Bank announced that gender equality was going to be one of its major focus areas. That is how we converge on the theme women and leadership. And uh, so now it is my pleasure and privilege to return the podium to Professor Cohen, who will introduce our exemplary leader, Ambassador Brown. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. I'm from the East Coast, so I begin formally. Honored Ambassador, Consul General, Chief Secretary, family and friends of Sarah Kailat, scholars of Berkeley, and visitors from Stanford. <laughs> Great chin of being. See, um, I cannot tell you how happy I am to introduce our honored speaker. The third Sarah Kailat Memorial Lecture will be delivered by Mir Pamarao, who has just stepped down as the ambassador of India and the United States, only to immediately take up another appointment as the Mira and Vikram Gandhi Fellow with the Brown India Initiative at the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University, where she is completing a book studying the critical early years of the China-India relationship and offering a radical and long overdue revision of Nehru's role, among much else. In July 2009, she became the second woman ever to hold the post of Indian Foreign Secretary, the head of the Indian Foreign Service. In her career, she has in fact served in multiple prominent roles, including Minister of Press Affairs in Washington, Deputy Chief of Mission in Moscow, the first woman in the critical role of spokesperson of the External Affairs Ministry, the Ambassador to Peru, the Ambassador to China, the High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, and the list goes on and on and on. Ambassador Rao is visiting the Bay Area for several days with her husband, the also very illustrious Sudhakar Rao, former Chief Secretary of Karnataka State. There's much more I could say about the ambassador. She's a singer, I learned from another. She is an accomplished poet, currently finishing, I believe, her second major collection. She is a mountaineer who led a pilgrimage across the Himalayas to Tibet. And her writing on China reflects a lifetime of service to improving and rethinking a secure and sustainable relation between India and China. I can think of no one more apt to address us and to honor the member, memory of Sarah Kainat, Ambassador. Professor Tom Kailat, Dr. Anu Metra, Professor Lawrence Cohen, members of the Kailat family, dear friends. My husband, who is also here with me today, and I, are deeply honored and privileged to be in your midst this evening. I'm particularly privileged to have been asked to deliver the third Sarah Kailath Memorial Lecture. I know that Sarah was a remarkable presence in your lives and that she exemplified the spirit of kindness and giving, loved and admired by her family and friends, a true personification of infinite grace and courage. Her memory is an inspiration for all of us who seek to bridge East and West, India and America, blending the best of both our civilizations in the lives we lead, as Sarah did through the power of her uplifting and abiding love and compassion for all the lives she touched. Madeleine Albright once said, and I quote, for democracy to thrive without women is impossible. If women are undervalued or underdeveloped, then that democracy is imperfect and incomplete, unquote. The story of the lives of the three Indian women I will speak of today demonstrates the power of example, of a will to question conventional beliefs and stereotypes with rational eloquence, to shoulder immense burdens through their lives as they sought the achievement of their goals, to work for social justice, and to exert their utmost in the cause of peace and freedom. I thought I should refer to the examples of these women because there is much debate today about the parlous state of Indian womanhood and that we, the women of India, 
are the victims of voicelessness and invisibility. Be that as it may, the trinity of women who will be in focus in today's talk remains as revolutionary and path-breaking today as it was 60 years ago when we emerged as a young democracy consolidating our nationhood. The roads they traveled, the gulfs they bridged, the authorities they challenged make their story educated and inspirational. Their lives reflect the fact that at the core of the idea of India, there is an imagination that is inclusive, progressive, and visionary. The curtain on my story today rises at the turn of the 20th century with the birth of three women protagonists, Hansa Mehta, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, or Madam Pandit, as she was known internationally, and Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. The epithet Great Lady, or Woman of the Century, applies to each one of them. They were the genuine, pure, and soaring voices of Indian womanhood. In their lives, each of them epitomized the translation into concrete doing of Gandhiji's clarion call, India cannot be free until its women are free, and women cannot be free until India is free. <coughs> Hansa Mehta from the state of Gujarat rose through the ranks of our freedom struggle to become a member of India's first constituent assembly and also a member of the first UN Human Rights Commission charged with the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, the first ever woman in the world to be ambassador to the Soviet Union and the United States of America and the United Kingdom, was also president of the United Nations General Assembly. And finally, Kamala Devi Chachopadhyay, who has aptly been called by the historian Ramachandra Guha as the greatest Indian woman of the 20th century. In each of these women, the elements of feminism, nationalism, and internationalism combined with such balance and equilibrium that we can hold up each example to the world and say, this was a woman. The words that the novelist Raja Rao used to describe Kamala Devi can be applied to each of them. They were firmly Indian and therefore universal, highly sophisticated, both in sensibility and intelligence, and they walked with everyone in city and country with utter simplicity. I will begin with Hansa Mehta. An active participant in Mahatma Gandhi's Satyagraha campaigns from 1930 onwards, she began her public life as a social worker and educationist. She was one of the women members of the first Constituent Assembly of India from before partition and later a member of India's first parliament. She served as a member of the first UN Human Rights Commission, as I just mentioned, and later on the executive board of the UNESCO. As vice chancellor of Baroda University, she was the first woman in India to be the head of a university that was not exclusively for women. The early 20th century was not the best time to be an Indian woman. Child marriage, female illiteracy, and taboos on widow remarriage were the order of the time. But Hansa Mehta was treading a different path and showing by example what that difference meant. She graduated from school and college with outstanding proficiency and went on to study journalism in London. She married at what was for that time the ripe old age of 25, a man outside her caste for love. She plunged into educational work and was one of the founders of the All India Women's Conference in 1927, whose demand for a minimum age of marriage for girls saw the Sharda Act of 1929. Here was a woman who left her young children in the care of their father to join the agitation surrounding Gandhi's salt march of 1930, 
picketing foreign cloth and liquor shops. Imprisoned three times while in jail, she translated Shakespeare's Hamlet and The Merchant of Venice into Gujarati. In 1937, she became Parliamentary Secretary for Health in the Bombay Presidency with authority over her husband, who was then in charge of Bombay's largest hospital. In 1946, she appeared before the Cripps Commission on behalf of the women of India, and from 1946 to 1952, she served with Eleanor Roosevelt on the UN Human Rights Commission. All in all, she was, as the British newspaper The Guardian described her in 1966, a formidably accomplished woman, a genuine pioneer. At the cusp of India's independence, at that dawn of a new chapter in the nation's history, it was bliss to be alive and Indian. India's profile on the world stage was an indisputably prominent one, given its position at the forefront of the tectonic shift towards decolonization and the end of empire. And women like Hansa Mehta were in the lead to provide this vision of a new India. She had already established for herself a reputation as an outspoken crusader for women's rights and emancipation. She had spoken out against Parda and that any evil practiced in the name of religion cannot be guaranteed by the Constitution. And in New York, she was the one who persuaded Eleanor Roosevelt that Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights should read, not all men are born free and equal, but all human beings are born free and equal. Expressing disagreement with Mrs. Roosevelt's assertion that the word men was generally accepted to mean all human beings. In her work at the UN, Mehta looked beyond the non-justiciable Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Speaking in 1949, she said, the General Assembly of the United Nations passed the first part of the International Bill of Human Rights, that is, the Declaration of Human Rights. The Human Rights Commission will have still to prepare the covenant of human rights, which will be a legal document. She was clear that this should be the eventual goal of any international effort to establish a globally justiciable platform for human rights. Geopolitics, of course, intervened to block any easy passage of such a covenant. But working in the Fundamental Rights Subcommittee of the Constituent Assembly of India, Mehta was focused in ensuring that the chapter on fundamental rights in India's constitution should be a legal document and that the rights as defined in that chapter are justiciable rights. India had thus embedded, as Professor Manu Bhagwan says, the declaration into its national synthesis. It demonstrated the global vision of pioneers like Mehta as well as their constant awareness of India's connectedness with the larger world and its sense of obligating itself to global standards of accountability on human rights. Today, Mehta is also seen as having made sure that the Declaration on Human Rights spoke with power and clarity about equal rights for women well before they were recognized in most legal systems. In the words of Gita Sagal, by ensuring that the wording of Article 1 of the Declaration read, all human beings are equal in dignity and rights, and arguing that if the word men was used, it would not be regarded as inclusive, but rather taken to exclude women, she became the key figure who ensured gender equality in the document. It was a perspective honed during the freedom struggle, when India's new generation of women spoke of not turning women into imitations of men, but insisting on equal status and opportunity so as to achieve for women the possibility of development under favorable circumstances of education and opportunity. We would like to displace, as they said, the picture so deeply impressed upon the racial imagination of man striding forward to conquer new worlds, woman following wearily behind with a baby in her arms. The picture which we now envisage is that of man and woman, comrades of the road, going forward together, the child joyously shared by both. 
Such a reality we feel cannot but raise the manhood and womanhood of any nation. Mehta, like others in her cohort, was not seeking crumbs or leftovers. She was not asking for privileges, but for social justice, economic justice, and political justice. She sought that equality which, as she said in words that are as relevant today as they were 60 years ago, those words which can alone be the basis of mutual respect and understanding, and without which real cooperation is not possible between man and woman. She sought that equality. The segment on Hansa Mehta will not be complete without a reference to her role during that midnight of the 14th, 15th August 1947 when Free India was born. She, on behalf of the women of India, presented the flag of the newly independent country to the President of the Constituent Assembly, Rajendra Prasad, with these historic words which bear quoting in full. It should be in the fitness of things that the first flag that should fly over this august house should be a gift from the women of India. We have donned the saffron color, we have fought, suffered and sacrificed in the cause of our country's freedom. We have today attained our goal. In presenting the symbol of our freedom, we once more offer our services to the nation. We pledge ourselves to work for a great India, for building up a nation that will be a nation among nations. We pledge ourselves for working for a greater cause to maintain the freedom that we have attained. May this flag be the symbol of that great <coughs> India and may it fly high in the gloom that threatens the world today. May it bring happiness to those who live under its protective care. The second heroine in my story, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, was one of the most admired women in international political life of her times. Her success in overwhelming with charm, erudition, and eloquence, the formidable propaganda machine of the British Empire during her lecture tour of America, following the death in prison of her husband, Ranjit Pandit, in the mid-1940s, caused the acid-tongued Lady Astor to remark that, I quote, if the British had not been in India, that woman would have been burnt on her husband's funeral pyre. <laughs> when she died in 1990, the obituary in one British newspaper said, I quote, the international career of the diminutive Mrs. Pandit, sophisticated, sleek, silvery, and swathed in silks, was unmatched in her time. There can be little doubt that Madame Pandit, as she was universally referred to, was the most effective and perhaps the most affectionately regarded woman diplomat of her century. In 1949, as ambassador of India to the United States, while being conferred an honorary degree by Dr. Mordecai Johnson, president of Howard University, the latter said, you were born to wealth and station, but when you lifted up your voice in behalf of the dependent peoples, you made yourself the dear ambassador to the hearts of millions of human beings who never saw your native land, but will henceforth love you and look toward you with hope." Unquote. Born into the lap of luxury, the young Swaroop, as she was called in her youth, wanted for nothing in her growing up years. But the freedom struggle changed her life and that of her families. Prison and the sacrifice of family life became a part of her existence as also long periods spent away from her three young daughters. Her husband's death in prison in 1943 left her incomeless and it was in those circumstances that the world of diplomacy unexpectedly opened up for her. Riding an American transport plane to the United States from India Without a passport, since the British had denied her one, she was a 44-year-old widow in a strange and foreign country without any preparation of what lay ahead. But overnight, things changed. She became the propagandist for an India that had not had a voice in America before that. The British were going all out to present Gandhi as dangerously erratic, 
and Nehru as the Hamlet of India, a high-minded but ineffective aristocrat dabbling in politics, unquote. And here was Mrs. Pandit embarking on a lecture tour of America, speaking on the theme of why India wants independence and what kind of a post-war world. Suddenly, she was a page one figure. Her daughter, Nayantara, spoke thus of her mother. She had a flair for human relationships and attracted people like a magnet. She lived with a robustness of response and a generosity of gesture. The Americans were fascinated. At the San Francisco United Nations Conference in 1945, again, she dazzled audiences even though she headed no official delegation, but represented the India League of America and the Committee for Indian Freedom. Her statements about India, about democracy, her speech at the California legislature at Sacramento made her eclipse the official Indian delegation with news reports describing her as dainty and deft with the velocity of the wind that rides roughshod over all obstacles. <laughs> Mrs. Pandit's focus in San Francisco had been to seek an early termination of colonialism. At the time of inception of the United Nations, that struggle had not been fully won. But by the time Mrs. Pandit was called upon to lead the Indian delegation to the UN in 1946, there was already an interim government in Delhi headed by Jawaharlal Nehru, her brother. The issue of immediate urgency for the delegation was the treatment of Indians in South Africa, a matter that the South Africans argued was within their domestic jurisdiction and not, therefore, to be inscribed on the United Nations agenda. The Indians argued differently. After all, human rights were fundamental to all mankind. They were advocated in the UN Charter, and therefore South Africa stood in violation of the very basis on which the UN had been founded. Mrs. Pandit was pitch perfect in her delivery, and veteran observers were bowled over when she spelt out India's vision for the United Nations and to follow the charter, and how we should follow the charter in spirit and letter, the very <coughs> fact of which South Africa stood in violation of. She was brilliant and emotionally electric in weaving together a narrative of tragedy concerning the Indians of South Africa, receiving rave notices from even the normally hard to impress the New York Times. She did not rant, she was reasonable and humane. In the United States, where her previous tour had won her many admirers, including the NAACP, and the singer Paul Robeson, she had many voices raised in her support. When the South Africans derided Indian culture and customs with crude insults and talking about and talked about defending a superior Christian civilization, she ripped them apart by saying that according to extant South African laws, even Jesus Christ would be a prohibited immigrant in the South Africa of the 1940s. Her appeal, neither aggressive nor humble, wiping a fortuitous tear from her eye, was on behalf of all the voiceless people, as she termed it, who had been denied justice for centuries on ground of creed and color. When India won the vote against South Africa in the General Assembly, Nehru said that the new India had made a most auspicious beginning on the stage of international politics. Mrs. Pandit had played a leading part in that campaign and her diplomatic skills were shown to be of the highest order. As a result of India's efforts, the international community was now committed to the defense of human rights and fundamental freedoms. India's efforts to pro protest discrimination against Indians in South Africa <clears throat> proved to be the thin end of the wedge that prized open the door for the UN to go on to discuss all of South Africa's racial policies. When she was asked by her brother, the Prime Minister, to go to Moscow as India's first ambassador to the Soviet Union, Mrs. Pandit was told by both Orthodox Hindus and Muslims that, I quote, ambassador is not a job for a woman. 
<laughs> she who loved challenges immediately rose to the occasion. She told her brother, all right, I'll go. I'll do the best I can. The Indian press sat, said that this little lady could hold the scene in Russia, even if Napoleon and Hitler got lost on the steps, <laughs> since she was not going as an invader. Iron ironically, since the Republic of India still did not exist when she arrived in Moscow on August 5th, 1947, 10 days before independence, her letter of credence was signed by King George VI, <laughs> referring to the special trust and confidence in the discretion and faithfulness of our trusty and well-beloved, the Honorable Madam Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, a person of approved wisdom, loyalty, diligence, and circumspection. In fact, uh, as I was preparing for this talk, I realized that she was the first woman ambassador globally to go as ambassador to the Soviet Union, as also to the United States and as also to the United Kingdom. In May 1949, she became India's first woman ambassador to the United States, a country that knew her well already. When asked by a woman journalist on arrival, tell me, Mrs. Pandit, how does it feel to be world feminist number one? She <laughs> said, I am not a feminist, as far as I can see, the question of being male or female has nothing to do with the duty of both sexes to take their part in world affairs. In America, much to her concern, the media took an inordinate interest in her coiffure, a type most wo women dream of but seldom achieve, they said, her pastel saris, her great lady elegance, as if, as she said, I were a visitor from Hollywood. <laughs> but she was immensely quotable wherever she went, as, as when she was asked whether she had any university degrees, she did not, and answered that she held none, adding, in India, so-and-so was in prison with me, is another way of saying we were at Oxford together. <laughs> but she was again pitch perfect in her defense of India's positions on Kashmir, on non-alignment, on her country, country's support for the admission of China to the United Nations, and she began to be listened to by Americans as they would listen to a man. Here in San Francisco in 1949, speaking to the League of Women Voters, she lamented the lack of constructive thinking for peace in the world and the need for emerging of the East and West in the quest for a formula for peace which would involve an end of discrimination and colonial rule and opportunities for backward people. In this context, let us also recall her famous words, the more we sweat in peace, the less we bleed in war. Writing a profile of her in September 1953 on the eve of her assumption of duties as the first woman president of the United Nations General Assembly, the Observer newspaper had this to say about the paradox in Mrs. Pandit's reputation. It referred to the fact that while she was an ardent champion of the rights of Asian and African peoples, she has none of the assertiveness derived from a feeling of inferiority which so often accompanies this attitude. <laughs> she treats Americans and British with genuinely effortless equality. She has refused utterly to join the anti-communist camp, yet her political outlook is without that radical fervor which distinguishes her brother, the Premier, Jawaharlal Nehru. <laughs> she has feminine charm, yet she has contested the toughest <coughs> American and Russian diplomats, emerging always unruffled, and usually victorious. There is probably no one better able to deal with the spokesman of the great powers than this determined and gifted lady whose life has taught her to understand the politics of revolution, the responsibilities of administration, and the possibilities and impossibilities of modern diplomacy. What made her unique was her sense of proportion her ability to rise above hatred, her embrace of freedom as that magic word that would make her soar above the smallness of the divisive and mundane. My narrative about Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay 
begins on a train in racially segregated Louisiana in 1941. Visiting the state while on an extended tour of the United States as a single mother with her teenage son, she was asked to vacate her seat on the train by the conductor. Kamala Devi was unmoved, saying to the conductor that, I am a colored woman and it is unnecessary for you to disturb me for I have no intention of moving from here. <laughs> After some toing and froing, the conductor muttered, you are an Asian, and did not bother her again. But like Rosa Parks, some 14 years later, Kamala Devi had stood her ground. Standing her ground was a late motif that described Kamala Devi throughout her distinguished life. When she passed away in 1988, the then president of India, R. Venkataraman, referred to Kamala Devi as, I quote, an invisible Saraswati, invisible, but no less real, no less benevolent. She was a Ganga of purity and power. Flower buds seemed to blossom at her touch, whether they be flower buds of human beings or institutions. Two interests never missed her eye. One was human justice, and the other was human creativity or self-expression. In fact, her entire life was a continuous dialogue with either questions of justice or creativity. And the fields she covered, political, social, aesthetic, and the purely human, were imbued by these twin interests, justice and creativity. The idiom of Gandhiji's movement coalesced with the poetry of Kamala Devi's sensibility. Kamala Devi's life epitomized the quintessential values of a feminism shot through and through with a glorious humanism. She was president of the Youth Congress at the age of 26 in 1929. On January 26, 1930, she captured the imagination of the entire nation when in a scuffle she clung to the tricolor in order to protect it. As lathis, or sticks as you know, rained on her by the police, she stood like a rock to protect the flag. Define the stereotype of the Indian woman as a timid and helpless bundle of nerves. In April 1930, she was one of the two women chosen to defy the salt laws in Bombay. She convinced Gandhiji to see the logic of women's participation in the salt satyagraha. In her words, the significance of a non-violent struggle is that the weakest can take an equal part with the strongest and share in the triumph as you have yourself said, she said to Gandhiji. This struggle is ideally suited for them. In the police attack on the people making salt on portable stoves at the Chaupati Sands, she received a lathi blow on her back, fell on the blazing poles and received burn injuries. Gopal Krishna Gandhi referred in a recent article to the black and white footage of her I quote, fanning a pot of boiling salt water, and with each vapor diminishing a wisp of imperial hubris. Mm -hmm. It is said of her that her inner core made her not only a doer, but a thinker. Her love of the arts defined her too. Her work in theater, she was a gifted actress, the trade union sector, her efforts to secure for women the right to maternity leave, respect and recognition for their work in the household as homemakers, and her concern for the welfare of women workers was pioneering and pathbreaking. Referred to often in her youth as the uncrowned queen of India, she combined beauty, sharpness of intellect, staunchness of conviction, courage, commitment, and grace. In the annals of India's freedom movement, Kamala Devi came to symbolize a whole climate of progressive opinion. In the words of Kapila Vatsayan, for Kamala Devi, life was an integrated whole, the hand, the heart, and the mind, and an unflinching commitment went together. She eschewed power, position, explicit political leadership. It was the mission of alleviating the suffering of the people which was her calling. Her calling was public service, not public office. 
and her political interests developed into social interests. She became Hastakala Mata, the mother of handicraft, rescuing women after partition, doing grassroots level work to promote the recognition of Indian handlooms and handicrafts, giving dignity and value to the products of our artisans. She introduced the world to the many splendid universe of Indian crafts, and she came to know the living and working conditions of artisans all over the country. A standard bearer of revolution and justice, Kamala Devi soon become, became an ombudsman for the artisans of India, a lodestar and a point of reference. The Mexican poet and diplomat Octavio Paz once said, Kamala Devi's mind is an ocean, an oceanic heart which could contain a thousand sorrows, regrets, aspirations, not just her own, but those of others as well. Her gift for identification helped her to be a part of every corner of India that she was in. And she was both an active player and an engaged witness in the momentous passage of modern Indian history in the 20th century. In her own words, I can talk of some of the significant events and some of the personalities, not as distant historical figures cast on an imaginary screen, but as part of my own life and my own contemporaries with whom I shared some of the adventures, hopes, fears, sorrow, and from whom I drew inspiration, sustenance, and above all, warm companionship. She became an authentic voice of Indian womanhood and a voice for peace and dialogue. Her comment on Robert Oppenheimer quoting the Gita when the first nuclear explosion was conducted in New Mexico stands out in this regard. She said, will the pious Hindus who recite the Gita heed this and await Krishna's coming with a Sudarshan Chakra transformed by modern bhaktas, the nuclear scientists, into a nuclear weapon to bring about the long predicted global pralaya, mm. unquote. Pralaya meaning upheaval, revolution. The noted Gandhian scholar and cooperative worker, Lakshmi Chand Jain, called Kamala Devi a karma yogi, saying she spent a lifetime filling the voids around her. And that to her, the concrete expressions of human rights were the means for an autonomous, dignified, and created life as land could provide to the tillers, factory to the workers, and yarn to the handloom weavers. She must be an inspiration, not for the successes that she was able to grasp, but for the pursuit of the unaccomplished tasks of India's second revolution, to which she dedicated herself with all her heart and soul. From her early days in the freedom movement, Kamala Devi was concerned with the role of women in modern society. In her view, the women's movement does not seek to make women either fight men or imitate them. It rather seeks to instill into them a consciousness of their own faculties and functions and create a respect for those of the other sex. Thus alone can society be conditioned to accept the two as equals. To fit women theoretically and practically into the scheme, women have to be encouraged to develop their gifts and talents. She wanted a recognition also of the value of women's economic worth. In her presidential address to the All India Women's Conference in 1944, she spoke of the tragedy of the non-pecuniary and non-competitive character of housekeeping by a wife as having lowered the prestige of the women's role. In her words, quote, husbands who claim they support their wives simply because the latter do not bring home a paycheck are being antisocial, upsetting the harmonious social equilibrium and breaking social solidarity. Mm. It was high time society recognized that every housewife supported herself by the social labor she performed and the contribution she made towards the maintenance of the home and its happiness. In this, she was prepared even to take on Mahatma Gandhi. Mm. She was not in unison with Gandhiji's utilization of the symbolism of the self-sacrificing woman, Sita, Draupadi, Savitri, Damayanti, in his writings. 
By the 1930s, Kamala Devi and other women activists had found their own voices, no longer in keeping with Gandhi's perspective, giving expression to a new indignation, a new rage, and as a child widow herself, who married a second time later for love, she denounced, for instance, the tendency in Indian families to marry off their girls very early. Over half of the girls were being married under the age of 15, she noted and said, but these figures hardly indicate the enormity of the damage. These reports pass silently over the hundreds and thousands of young, blossoming girls wrecked for life physically and psychologically by forced premature motherhood. By all moral codes it is rape, but our social conscience is hard bound by dead old usages. So the murders and rape go on while we sit and gloat over the past glories of the dead and gone, Sitas and Savitris. <laughs> Impressive too was Kamala Devi's stress on the cultural side of the daily needs of mankind, the delicate creations in word, song, and color in which the dreams of mankind find expression. For her, the growth of crafts in society was the sign of the cultivation of sensitivity and the stirring and mellowing of humanism. She pointed to the importance of cultural industries long before the World Bank discovered the concept. She was alert to the need for preservation of traditional knowledge systems and bringing them to the global market. She was also concerned about the underutilization of the labor of women. <coughs> Writing in 1987, she said, the main segment of the human community that stands out as calling for special attention is women who have not in the past been treated as a rich source for building up society. Women resources were being used suboptimally. Women were conditioned by society to accept the second grade in treatment and they were not encouraged or facilitated in obtaining the skills necessary to contribute to economic growth of the country. She bemoaned, she bemoaned the lack of intelligent and purposeful guidance relating to women. Importantly, she wanted young women to be trained for jobs in new technologies, which would serve to bring them into the current mainstream, accustom them to a machine-propelled world, inject into them greater self-confidence, and use their native intelligence and ability to wider uses. This was the second revolution that India needed, one to which she dedicated her own self with unparalleled commitment and dedication. <coughs> the inner core of this fascinating woman is revealed also by her worldview. Speaking in the 1940s, well before the enunciation of independent India's foreign policy, she drew attention to the fact that India's insular peninsular outline had widened into the global with an increasing awareness that we and the rest of the world are but part of a single sphere, that our destinies are inevitably linked, our paths interlocked. It is not idle curiosity or cheap sentiment which shapes the question that haunts and harasses every diplomat like a family ghost. What about India? We may well say everything. India is more than a test, it is a symbol. It is the mirror in which the world sees the shape of things to be. It is towards a world which recognizes the right of every nation to determine and rule its own destiny, but in a cooperative world order that the women of India and of the world have to strive for if humanity is ever to enjoy decency, peace, and happiness. I hope that these examples of the leadership that women can personify and expound will be as enlightening and inspiring for you as they have been for me in my personal journey. Hansa, Vijayalakshmi, and Kamala Devi. These shining lodestars in my firmament have taught me that challenges exist to be challenged, that feminism does not mean the exclusion of men, that India can never be isolated from the world, that the insularity of a closed mind is to be fought against, that freedom is a sacred word. In conclusion, I dedicate my words to these founding mothers of India, whose battles were hard fought and whose struggle we must carry on. 
we will never walk alone because they ensured we would not. Mm. Mm. This was an extraordinary uh, talk and I'm full of fortuitous tears of pleasure, joy. <laughs> Uh, it's quite wonderful. Um, so uh, please, if, if you have any questions, uh, we'll bring around the microphone. Uh, Professor Goldman. Thank you, Ambassador, for a fascinating, moving uh, uh, talk. I just wonder if you could tell us a little more about the background of Hansa Ben Meta, what, what kind of a family background she came out of. Also, uh, Kamala Devi, if you could. Because Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Hansa was from Gujarat, as I mentioned, and her father was a highly placed, uh, I would say, appointee uh, in one of the princely states. So she came from a from a very, uh, you know, what, what shall I say, well positioned background. But uh, as I mentioned in my talk, you know, at that time, at the turn of the 20th century, the 20, early years of the 20th century, Indian women labored with a lot of you know, obstacles and encumbrances and, and there's prejudice and stereotypes about the role of women in society. So the very fact that she was able to break free of that, uh, she uh, went to high school, she did very well and was a prize winner in the school leaving examinations and then went on to take a degree in philosophy. Uh, I think it was in Bombay. And then later went on to England to study journalism. And in the meantime, she had met her husband, uh, who was not from the same caste as she was from. She came from a Brahmin family, but she married a Dr. Mehta, a very eminent uh, doctor, medical doctor, Dr. G. Raj Mehta. And uh, at the age of 25, as I mentioned, which was very, very late for a woman to be married in those days. And, uh, and she had very young children when she began to participate in the freedom campaign. She met Gandhiji the first time, I think it was in 1919, a few years after he had come back to India, and she plunged straight away into the Satyagraha movement. And later on, as I mentioned, she was with the Human Rights Commission. And then when her husband became High Commissioner to the UK in the 60s, she accompanied him as his wife. And she was quite a well-known figure there, you know, uh, associating herself with various worthy causes for the upliftment of women, even in, the, even in England. Kamala Devi was also the daughter of a, of a colonial service official. She was born in the southern port city of Mangalore in Karnataka. She belonged again to a, 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 a I think it was a Saraswat Brahmin family. And uh, her mother and grandmother had a big impact on her life. Uh, her grandmother was not an educated woman, but she could, uh, she was functionally literate. She could read from the scriptures and, and uh, you know, she had traveled the length and breadth of India even before the railways had been built with her husband on pilgrimage to various places, and she would talk about that. And Kamala Devi's mother, Girijabai, uh, was again uh, an educated woman who could speak a number of languages, including English, and it was a friend of Annie Besant and Margaret Cousins. And, and she introduced Kamala Devi as a young girl to these women when they came to Bangalore. In fact, Margaret Cousins was the principal of a school in Bangalore. Margaret Cousins, if you remember, was an Irish uh, suffragette. And she had left Ireland and, uh, because she, you know, she had come to the adverse notice of the British authorities and come to, uh, to India. She got involved with the Theosophy movement and uh, she came here. So these uh, women had a great influence on Kamala Devi. But I think uh, the independence of spirit, and mind you, she was a child widow when she was at the age of 14. And that could have been the end of life for her, in, as it was in those days. But her mother decided to take her to Madras, as it was then called. She completed her high school. And that was where she met, uh, came into contact with the Chattopadhyayas. And this was the family of Sarojini Naidu, if you remember. And the Chattopadhyayas were a Bengali family from Hyderabad, but who had come to um, take up residence in Madras. And uh, Sarojini's, uh, Sarojini Naidu's uh, 
sister, Ranalini Chattopadhyay, ran a salon in Madras to which a lot of intellectuals and others came. And Kamala Devi attended that salon. And she met uh, Harindranath Chattopadhyay, who was the brother of Ranalini. Uh, and they fell in love and got married. That was her second marriage. And Harindranath was an actor, poet. Um, he was a uh, he was also a man with a glad eye, so after some time, you know, he was unfaithful to Kamala Devi. So Kamala Devi got the first divorce uh, sanctioned by an Indian court for an Indian woman in the, in the 20s. But she had a son by that marriage, who I think is still alive, who must be in his 90s now, Rama Chattopadhyay. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if drawing on your own inspiration from Hansa Mehta and also your own um, many experiences at the Tables of Power. You could speak a little bit to what a global justiciable regime or human rights might look like. What would be its minimum requirements? Well, I think uh, its minimum requirements, I would, in fact, although this may not be the uh, you know, the way governments tackle this. But I think the vision that inspired Vijay Lakshmi Pandit when uh, she spoke about the difficulties encountered by Indians in South Africa and the fact that, uh, you know, domestic jurisdiction over the rights of these people uh, doesn't really uh, do justice uh, to the fundamental concepts of human freedom and human rights recognized by the United Nations. So I would go along with that definition. That is my personal mm -hmm. uh, you know, affiliation, let me say, and my personal uh, attachment mm -hmm. to, to how these concepts are defined. And having you know st lived in countries like Sri Lanka, for instance, where I saw uh, the conditions of, let's say, the estate workers mm -hmm. of Indian origin in Sri Lanka which was a huge problem. They were stateless. They had no citizenship. And India intervened uh, in their cause, in their favor, though what we were able to finally gain in terms of an understanding with the Sri Lankan government uh, to safeguard their rights may not have been the, the best solution. But it did help to finally end the problem of statelessness for these people. We took back a few of them. The rest of them were beginning to be granted citizenship. It was a long process until finally, towards the end of the 1980s, the Sri Lankan government decided to give all of them citizenship. Then again, there's the ethnic question in Sri Lanka that continues to, you know, move across, in a sense, affect us across borders because India, being a diverse, multilingual, uh, very large country. Uh, with smaller South Asian countries bordering some of our regional states, uh, foreign policy then becomes very much involved with how regional governments, state governments, uh, their outlook and their perspective on the treatment of certain issues in these countries, which are normally the, should be the concern only of foreign policy. But then that gets intermeshed with regional concerns. So I think, uh, as it happens today, geopolitics intervenes very much in the application and the enforce enforcement may not be the right word, but you know, the establishment of, of a regime that would, would satisfy uh, what the fundamental truths concerning human rights are. It's still an unfinished picture. Are you concerned that the hard fought victories, the progress made over the last century, are being eroded? Uh, we have uh, childcare getting more and more expensive, which uh, confines women more than it does men. We have countries where there's a reversion to fundamentalism, places where women can't drive. 
Uh, and a lot of the examples you've given are, are you know, sort of great, you know, great icons. But they are, they've come from privilege. You know? So how, how are the, how are the average unprivileged women in Indian society, for example? What is their, their uh, future? Is it, what is the direction we're taking? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Are you worried? Well, I did refer to the fact that uh, the struggle is not won for a number of uh, many millions of Indian women. Uh, you know, it's not that I have claimed that we have you know, achieved everything that we wanted in terms of our goals at, uh, at the advent of independence. Uh, India, as you know, is such a large country and there are many, many challenges that we still have to overcome when it comes to delivering the rights to development, as it were, to every man, woman, and child in the country. But I think that what the lives of these women demonstrates uh, demonstrate for us is that there is a certain foundation, there is a certain template, there is a certain architecture that we have been able to establish within India in terms of the rights, the fundamental rights, the laws, the general framework of a very strong and viable democracy that enables the underprivileged and the marginalized to have a voice. There's a great deal of mobility in Indian society today. And I think democracy and the very process of elections and, and uh, you know, the freedom of expression that exists in the country enables that voice to be heard. I think there is a growing and a very, very palpable consciousness in India that much, much more has to be done for the women of the country, particularly the poor and underprivileged women that you spoke of. In this context, I want to say that, you know, the picture is again very mixed because there are certain states in India that have made considerable progress in enhancing female literacy, for instance, in dropping maternal and child mortality, in uh, providing more skill development for women, the very things that Kamala Devi was speaking of. But I wanted to cite the examples that I cited in my talk just so that we are reminded of the fact that these women, women who really had their finger on the pulse 60 years ago and that we need to revive you know, that spirit if we are to get ahead and tackle those very disadvantages that many of our women still face. Thank you, thank you. This was most, uh, most enlightening. Um, as you know, Berkeley right now is um, celebrating the free speech movement, the outbreak of the free speech movement, which is of course tied in with civil rights as well. It just occurred to me, during the sojourn of uh, especially Vijay Lakshmi Pandey, perhaps also Kamala um, and given that she was also in, uh, in, in, in cohorts with uh, um, Eleanor Roosevelt on the framing of the United States <coughs> Declaration of Human Rights, but here's Mr. Rojani Naidu, um, who, uh, and also I think Mirabai, and several others who visited, Sheriff Andrews and so on. Before that, there was, of course, Harvial, uh, 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 Harvial here on this very campus, and Dharana Das. Gadar Party. Uh, yes, the Gadar Party, and, and also Haridas Mujumdar and so on. And these people were very involved with the early fomenters, if you like, of the civil rights movements from very early, probably Washington. Um, Locke, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey, and, and quite a number of people. Uh, Swajni and I did go to Stockton and did uh, have dialogues with the Sikhs there, which was quite, pretty, pretty, quite early actually, I think in the 19, 1920s. 1929, I think. 1929, that's right. But I wonder if, if Vijay, and I've not come across this literature, I'm very curious if, if she was in conversations with you know, people way before King, perhaps. Um, du Bois, I think, was still around at the time. 
you know, people who were very actively involved in civil rights movement and so on, they were of course hungry, they were, they were looking out for inspiration, Gandhiji is basically, and Tagore also, he also visited them, inspired a number of blacks too. I wonder if Vijay uh, played any role, and perhaps also Kamala Devi. Uh, and, and I wonder also, just in passing, if Kamala Devi is a name that was drawn by uh, the mother of the Gandhian of Kamala Devi Harris, who's uh, as well. <laughs> Well, I, I know that um, Mrs. or Madam Pandit uh, did have a number of friends, yeah, like in the NAACP. She was a friend of Paul Robeson. When she came here to, to California, uh, you know, the first trip when she came on her lecture tour, uh, she uh, visited the Stockton Gurdwara. She spoke to the congregation there. And, uh, you know, she had that honorary degree from Howard University very early into her tenure as ambassador with Dr. Mortisai Johnson, who was who inspired Martin Luther King, you know, to study Gandhi. So she uh, obviously was in touch with all these these people. So, uh, I mean, she was here, I think, at a time when uh, India was receiving a great deal of attention, a newly independent country, leading the, you know, the global movement for decolonization, the stature of Prime Minister Nehru. She was herself the sister of the Prime Minister, but in her own right, I think she was able to command audiences. And I would hold her example up as a wonderful uh, lesson on how public diplomacy should be conducted. Public diplomacy today is a buzzword for a lot of diplomats and in the conduct of foreign policy. And I think Vijay Lakshmi Pandit very early on was an exponent of uh, that style of diplomacy with great success. I think there are a number of lessons to be learned from her own experience here. Yeah.